All right, I'm gonna try and do this without going full Ian Malcolm on you. So, God help us from the hands of engineers. But we'll see how it goes. Meet Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi. You've probably heard a great deal about these three pups over the last week. News lines across the globe are heralding this trio as the resurrection of the long extinct dire wolf, which roamed the Americas between 250,000 years ago up until about 10,000 years ago, but unsurprisingly still managed an anachronistic but popular appearance on the TV show Game of Thrones. Dire wolves were part of a suite of mega predators that once dominated the American landscape, preying on mammoths and bison. Marginally larger than modern gray wolves, the first dire wolf specimens were discovered along the Ohio River in 1854. Since then, the remains of thousands of dire wolves have been found. Colossal Bioscience, the company that engineered Romulus, Remus, and Khaleesi, imagine a bright future where they can resurrect other extinct species and even provide much-needed genetic diversity to those that are critically endangered. Ben Lamb, co-founder of Colossal Bioscience, claims that their goal is to, quote, make extinction a thing of the past. So how did Colossal, as they claim, bring back dire wolves after tens of thousands of years? According to Colossal, they were able to recover two significantly intact DNA samples from dire wolf bones. They then used that recovered DNA to selectively edit portions of the gray wolf genome to engineer what they are choosing to call dire wolf embryos, which they then implanted into surrogate female dogs. The result, according to Colossal, is the de-extinction of dire wolves. But, despite the marketing ploys and the media hype, these are not dire wolves. They're a synthetic species of gray wolves given specific traits to make them dire wolf-like. In fact, as of 2021, recent DNA evidence suggests that dire wolves and modern gray wolves aren't all that closely related. Dire wolves are thought to have evolved in the Americas, where gray wolves are thought to have migrated to the Americas from Eurasia across the Bering Strait. But Colossal seems to be ignoring these inconvenient details, either because they have access to more recent DNA testing which they have not shared, or because ignoring inconvenient research is better for marketing. In truth, it is very difficult to nail down the exact relation between extinct species. And dire wolves are a perfect example. Despite the fact that thousands of dire wolf skeletons have been recovered, very, very few have yielded quality DNA samples. And if dire wolves and gray wolves did share a common ancestor, their genetic paths are thought to have diverged roughly 5 million years ago. Consequently, colossal bioscience faces some very reasonable criticism with regards to their claim to have engineered dire wolves back into existence, when in fact, they've done no such thing. It's not a real dinosaur. No? It ain't, kid. If you've ever taken one of those DNA heritage tests where you spit into the vial and they then share your supposed DNA lineage, you may have noticed that you keep getting updated guesses as to your genetic lineage. The science of DNA analysis is constantly evolving. Even with regards to the human DNA data pool, which is infinitely superior to that of dire wolves and other long extinct species. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that Colossal did in fact manage to resurrect a trio of unadulterated, genetically authentic dire wolves. While of course impressive, would their efforts do anything to serve their intended goal of one day making extinction a thing of the past? It's a question that I find worthy of discussion. If you've been watching At Home in Wild Spaces for long, you know that I believe in a full, robust toolset, which means that I am not necessarily opposed to genetically fortifying critically endangered species or even resurrecting extinct species. I'd love to see passenger pigeons or Tasmanian tigers return from the abyss, and I'd love to witness the revitalization of functionally extinct species like the northern white rhino. But as honorable and intriguing as that goal may be, Colossal's efforts do absolutely nothing to address the root mechanisms driving millions of species and quite possibly humanity itself towards extinction. With the exception of truly extinct species, nature has the fully formed ability to heal and restore itself. 
if only given time and space to do so. Unfortunately, space and time are humanity's two least renewable resources, and we're consuming them ravenously. If we look at the wholesale destruction of, say, the Amazon or the Redwoods or even the bison herds of North America, as tragic as those losses are, these species and biomes can recover naturally, but only if we give them the time and space to do so. Unfortunately, the recoverable space needed for nature to work this miracle is shrinking by the minute. In the United States, 2,000 acres of farm and ranch land are lost or compromised every single day. And that figure doesn't even include dangerous attempts to convert U.S. federal lands into urban centers. So what is it that I'm proposing? In truth, our open spaces are collapsing, and we are wasting the precious resources that we have left. The modern housing crisis bears this out in excruciating detail. You've probably heard that we don't have enough homes for people to live in, right? Except we do. When it comes to residential resources, we're acting in opposition to our own self-interest, and it's sabotaging humanity and wildlife alike. The key to helping ourselves and the other species that rely on this planet is to identify those areas where we have been foolish and wise up. I recently returned from another trip to Zion National Park, one of the heavenly landscapes protected within the U.S. National Park system. And year after year, I have watched the open space surrounding this and other popular national parks vanishing, being replaced by vacation resorts and housing developments. Our national parks and public lands are turning into islands, surrounded by supercharged development and deceitful urban sprawl. While there is a very strong argument for the necessity of homes for individuals and families, large percentages of both existing and new homes, while residential in their zoning and construction, are not even remotely residential in their use. Instead, falling prey to poorly or unregulated commercial guest services and investment firms, with roughly 700 million people using short-term rentals each year without an inkling of the terrible implicit costs inflicted on humanity and wild spaces by the short-term rental industry. In the United States alone, there are roughly 2.5 million single-family residential homes now locked up in commercial vacation rentals. To make no mention of hosts installing cameras and bedrooms and bathrooms, or the fact that short-term rentals like Airbnbs and Verbos are frequently used as pop-up brothels where minors are trafficked as sex workers. Now, resorts and hotels aren't necessarily much better, but they use far less land and have to adhere to zoning laws and regulatory agencies. And short-term rentals are just one of countless examples of how we are sabotaging ourselves by using far more land than is prudent. I grew up in the shadow of the Bingham Canyon mine, the largest open pit mine on earth. I've watched it grow like a tumor year after year after year, erasing entire mountains and converting precious watershed and critical wildlife habitat into an ever-expanding, worthless, toxic, barren wasteland. I've tasted the water poisoned by the mine and watched politicians celebrate the unfathomable amount of virgin resources stripped from the land in an upside-down meritocracy where we judge success by how much we consume and destroy rather than by what we save. Without meaningful changes to how we use the land, it won't matter how successful colossal or other genetic engineering firms are at resurrecting or fortifying extinct or endangered species. Without wild spaces to allow nature to heal, the very best that we can hope for are zoos stocked with synthetic species and generations of humans for whom an intact, functional, and healthy ecosystem is little more than theoretical. Without giving nature time and space to heal itself, it will all be synthetic imitations of something far more precious. And coming from someone who has watched wolves run wild, watched grizzlies battle over resources, and been surrounded by stampeding bison, there's no comparison. Zoos have their purpose, but they will never compete with wilderness. If bioengineering proves to be a viable tool in our crusade to heal what we have destroyed, then I am all on board. 
But don't expect me to call a synthetic gray wolf a dire wolf. Dire wolves are not back and colossal bioscience did not accomplish what they claim. And a thousand photo ops with George R.R. Martin holding genetically altered gray wolf pups won't change a thing. Nor does their work address the root cause of extinction. Making extinction a thing of the past won't begin in the laboratory. It begins with meaningful changes in how we use and abuse the land. Please consider hitting join below this video or joining our team over on Patreon. And if a monthly membership isn't right for you, you can still click thanks below this video and make a one-time donation to At Home and Wild Spaces. If you're interested in learning more about wolves and separating fact from fiction, then make sure to subscribe and stay tuned. I've been hard at work on my cut the crap guide to living with wolves, and boy, there's a lot to share. So until next time, this is Mike inviting you to measure your success not by what you consume, but by what you save.